Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video, we'll be continuing with the novel Children of Ruin by Adrian Tchaikovsky. This is part 8. This novel is the second in the series Children of Time and you can find the link to the playlist for the series at the end of the video. Before we begin, please subscribe if you haven't, give us a like, drop us a comment and now we continue. The parasites remember, that's what they do. They remember to a time when they weren't sentient. They didn't have the ability to record their actions and experiences. Then one day, one of them gained the ability to record themselves, and that was the first archive. Then all the others of them either changed or perished. From then on, each generation would record in the archive what it survived and how it survived. The codes of chemicals and altered structures and all the tricks that permitted them to survive was budded into new generations and they would pass that knowledge on to each other and they learned new ways of being. They learned about their enemies and some that they had to adapt to overcome and there were others that adapted to hunt them so they had to find places to hide where the enemies couldn't find them. And some of those places were complex and dangerous and they had to change themselves to survive within them and how to control them and to fortify them against their enemies. And that knowledge was put in the archives and passed down to the generations. And one day they became sentient and self-aware. They kept changing hosts. And one day they found a host that would live out of water. And they found that living on land was safer. And they found a way to cultivate their hosts for their comfort. They thought they had mastered the universe. And they thought that the tiny cages of their hosts and their needs was the world. Then one day they found something new, something they've never seen before. And they were curious. And now they wonder if they wouldn't have been better off to stay how they was and not be curious. But they have never been content, so they exercise their curiosity. They remember how harsh the new host was and how he tried to kill them. And how a few of them learned how not to die. And that was placed in the archives. They learned how to not trigger the defenses of that brutal place. Then they found a place of complexity in that host that knew of itself as Gav Lortis, and they sat and they listened in humility and awe as the complex interactions that put together Lortis spoke to one another. They learned those interactions, they copied them, and then they became Lortis, and that taught them that this was an adventure and that this was a vast world that called itself Lortis was but a tiny thing in a universe that was beyond anything they could imagine. That was Lortis's adventure and they wanted that. And they met his crewmates and they became Rani and Lanti. And Lanti they loved the most because Lanti's own archives showed them who they were. They lost some of those that went to the Baltiel host and they were left with Lanti because they could not sustain Rani. They tried to create the adventure themselves but they were never able to. They thought maybe those that went with Baltiel had went on that adventure and didn't come back to rejoin them. They were Lanti for many generations until they lost the physical host of Lanti. They were taken to a much smaller place and they tried to study it, but eventually they had to enter their cryptic state to conserve resources. And now they are in Meshna, but some of them feel that this is not the adventure they were promised. Some of them feel that this is nothing more than when they tried to build Lanti's memories in sand. And now in this new complexity, They've modeled Lenti and it in themselves and they've modeled Lenti's cognitive processes and became more thoughtful in order to process it. And in doing so, they have changed. And by simulating Lenti's brain, they see themselves as she saw them. And now as they're looking at the unassimilated complexity that is still inside of Meshna, they know it has seen them and they have seen it. And they want to see the universe, they want to understand the universe but all they can do is generate it from within themselves and the universe exists outside in the sky so now what so kern in meshness implant allowed the parasite to take the rest of him then she had set up a simulation for the parasite when it got in it went back down to the planet and took over fabian and viola and zane then it lured the Voyager in from the outskirts of the system, took them over and headed back to Kern's world where it took over everyone there. But in the end, the stars were still out of its reach. 
and now in a virtual simulation of Kern's world inside of Meshner's implant, she sits with the parasite that is Lanti and Meshner. And she asks it, do you see the problem? And it keens in frustration and grief. She then tells it that there once was a planet that humans made for themselves that was the domain of the spiders. And humans came to take it back. And both the humans and the spiders could have destroyed each other. But instead they found another way. There's always another way, even for you. Paul, the octopus ambassador, is trying to tell Helena something that she can't quite understand, but Portia figures it out. She tells her that he means that the warship that shot down the Lightfoot, the one that is now in orbit around the moon of Nod, is requesting to speak to her. So she's connected through, and with Portia's help, she finally understands what that distant octopus is trying to say. It is expressing admiration for her in the reference to her early transmissions and her account of their species' shared history. It appreciates what it understands. Then at the end, it tells them to go away. Ahab in the warship has just finished speaking to the human and its crab-like associate. It admitted admiration for them and now it tells them it wishes them to go away and take the meddling scientist with it. He watches as it responds to him that it says it's yawning to go and rescue its surviving companions from the planet's surface. It mourns and it hopes that Ahab will let it go. He of course tells it that it is naive and of the dangers of Nod, but it insists on continuing. And as Ahab is conferring with his counterpart on the science vessel, he sees a signal coming up from the downed ship and he now knows exactly where it is and he can destroy it thereby saving that human from sacrificing itself meanwhile back with portia and helena they have received a message from viola saying it has found us and nothing else and although portia keeps trying to hail kern and reach out to viola again they get no reply and just as helena is beginning to believe that all is lost kern contacts them she asks them if they are still in communication with the octopuses and when Portia says yes, then she says she requires them to translate for her. She goes on to tell them that she has a message from the parasite. It wants a truce. That's when Portia showed her that the commander of the warship was upset because they detected Kern's signal coming from the station instead of the planet. And while Kern is explaining to them that she is operating from the station instead of the planet's surface and that she has reached a detente with the parasites, the warship launched its missiles at her. And when Kern is told this, she pleads with Helena to get the octopus to destroy the missiles because she has reached an understanding with the parasite on behalf of all life that isn't it. So Kern speaks to Helena. Helena speaks to octopuses trying to convince them. She tells them that the organism wants to understand and learn from other life. It wants to reach out and grab the universe, but it doesn't want to be us and it doesn't want us to be it. It has learned its limits. So Ahab puts his missiles in orbit around Nod, not quite convinced, but willing to give them a chance. Kern takes advantage of that and sends a visual feed along with supporting data. Fabian watches as the creature took half a day to cut its way into the remnants of the Lightfoot. By then, all three had their suits on and was waiting. There was nothing else they could do. They sent out the Arty Fabian, which tried and failed to stop it from getting in. Once the creature was in and slowly began going towards them, they hear Kern saying, don't do anything rash. Kern goes on to say, to make no contact, wait. Then she asks Fabian if he's well, if he's hurt. Kern then sends out a drone that lands and falls over next to the light foot. She then calls an Artie Fabian to go out and get something that she has made. Artie Fabian goes out and gets a drill that was in the drone and comes back and injects it into the creature. What he did was to inject the creature with the same organism, only this specimen was from the orbital. At this point, Meshner takes over speaking, and he says, it'll be fine, we are golden, there's so much I need to tell you. When Fabian asks him, where is Kern? 
Meshner says she's withdrawn to the implant. This was her plan. I'm just doing my part. When Meshner was asked, what is the creature doing? Since it was just standing there, he says it's just received an ambassador. It's having a revelation. And if we are right, it's not a threat anymore. Over the next several days, Meshner kept the light foot in repair so that nobody starved or ran out of power. The creature by this time had gone outside and was just sitting there. And Meshner explained to them what Kern did, that she made the parasite understand and that what one sample understands can be instantly assumed by any other colony it comes into contact with. He goes on to explain that while the organism is many, it is also one, an exchange, knowledge and understanding among its many cells. And now it will travel with them, not as a devourer, but as a co-traveler. Viola, of course, was already figuring out how she could use that to increase the spider's drive for knowledge, while Fabian had already decided that that's one branch of science that she could keep to herself. Finally, the warship that was in orbit around the moon of Nod came down and got them. It came down, picked up the entire Lightfoot with the crew inside, and went back up into space with them. They met with the science vessel and its escort and were reunited with Helena and Portia. The scientists had already lost interest in the humans and the spiders. They were going over the orbital station and dismantling it, and that was what they came for, because Noah's work was in that station and had been rudely interrupted. They didn't really care about the alien ambassadors or the parasite. There was just a way to distract the warriors while they went off and got the station. It was over a year before the Voyager got in from the outskirts of the system. And all that time, the Lightfoot was worked into one of the sections of a home ship globe and was in orbit around Damascus. Helena and Portia was treated very comfortably, although they weren't quite trusted yet. Helena was beginning to communicate more precisely, refining her software and using the new bodysuit that she had devised that had shifting hues. Portia, meanwhile, was bored. She was tired of being cooped up. She wanted to go and explore space because she considered herself an explorer. She even thought about going back to Nod because it rankled her that Fabian and Viola beat her to it. Zane, of course, was happy to see the Voyager because she hadn't healed perfectly and she wanted a proper medical treatment. And Viola would have put off the Voyager's arrival for another year or so if it wasn't for Zane because she was busy building a virtual model for the interface with the parasites. Every once in a while, an octopus would come and speak to Viola using Helena as a translator. The science faction had gotten a hold of Noah's project that was on the station, and they had resurrected it, and now they were about to test it. And she and Portia was invited to witness the first test. Fabian, meanwhile, was working on implant version 2.0. They have since found out that the first implant was doing a lot more than they thought. It could act as a neutral ground between inorganic and organic and between species. Meanwhile, Avana Kern had disappeared and Meshner, his body anyway, was down on the planet. They weren't sure if the parasite would be able to leave his brain. And it seems that that version of Kern had overwritten herself to preserve Meshner. Then, of course, they came up with a plan to cure Damascus, and that plan was to insert some of the parasites that were in orbit down into the ones on Damascus. And, of course, the octopus was battling over whether it should even go ahead and do it, and then some of them just went ahead and did it, as that's what octopus does. The hope was that, just like on Nod, the parasites on Damascus would join, and the octopus would be able to go back to Damascus. The science faction was now going to test Noah's device. They were going to take it to the outer system to test it. They put it around an unmanned sphere ship, and then it worked. The new device doesn't travel through space. It travels in the fabric of space. Anything traveling through space is coming up against the speed limit. But if it travels in the fabric of space, it's not subject to that speed limit. But they did not know until a year later when the signal from the device finally reached them. The ship was built by the octopuses and it held five different species. Some of them were children of Nod 
and all of them were children of earth in one way or another. They were in a system with a red star that had nothing habitable and they were searching for life. The rarest thing of all. The system had massive planets, all of which were at least three times larger than earth, none of which had life, but on the outer planet's moons there were organic chemistry that may theoretically be alive. Anyone who wanted to be on this trip and was not aquatic could swap out their lungs for gills. They could always swap them back later. The first reports from the survey crew had suggested that maybe they had found life. They will take a sample and add it to their archives and they may go and visit but they won't interfere and then someday, maybe in a thousand years, maybe in a hundred thousand years, they'll come back to see how things are going. They receive messages from other ships, the oldest of which is getting to them at the speed of light. News telling them what their ancestors did and what their cousins found. And they note some worlds that might be worth revisiting, worlds that are currently undertaking evolutionary processes. They get news about the passing of family and friends and the birth of new ships. Then they get real news from a probe that was traveling by wave, wave crest to wave crest, following their beacons until it found them. Since traveling that way is very energy intensive, some of their crew thought that it had to be war. But a narrator, who would formerly have been called a parasite but now a cavid, doesn't think it's war. What is there to fight over? Space is endless. The universe is bigger than they can ever exhaust. It was a new discovery on a very far away sun around a very far away world. A small ship of their cousins found something. And since they could not properly explore it, they sent for us. They quickly sent for their survey team to come back. And in a year, the survey team returned with their data. And what's a year? They have all the time in the universe. So they charged up their ship and they made their own waves and headed out across a hundred light years. They arrived in the system a hundred years after the original ship sent out its message. And around the fifth planet of the system was a structure that was seven kilometers across and a kilometer high. It was star-shaped. It was dead. It had no power. And the planet had lost whatever atmosphere it ever had. And it was not native. Someone left it there a million years ago. On the planet below, the pioneer ship that was there earlier left a gift for the narrator, a cryptobiote. It takes it and pours it into itself. It contains everything they ever were and all the lives that were in them and all of the information and archives they had. It is now them and they are written into the archives of its cells. It has been human Orted, octopus, stomatopod, and COVID. It is now 43 individuals. It is Baltiel, Lante, Meshner, Viola, Salome. It is many. They are going to split the ship. Half of them will carry on with the travels. The other half will stay here to study this alien artifact. As the new ship child grows, it will split itself. It will go with the others and it will stay and maybe one day it will meet itself and learn what it learned and as they stay and investigate this alien ruin maybe they will learn where they came from maybe they're still out there one day they will meet living intelligences and on that day when they meet them they will learn them and learn how to speak with them and invite them on the journey if they wish to come and that is how the novel ends I want to thank you for watching and listening Subscribe if you haven't, give us a like, drop us a comment, and I will see you in the next video.